Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ashri, for giving me this opportunity. First, I could declare I have no conflict of interest. Now, we know PCOS is affecting metabolic and reproductive life of a woman. Majority of these women are suffering from anovulatory infertility. Therefore, most of them require ovulation induction. And we know for years after years, clovifin was used as the first line of aging. That's why there was extensive evidence on clovifin and we know what is meant by clovifin resistance and how to manage them. On the other hand, nowadays, letrozole is considered as the first line of aging. But unlike clovifin, resistance on letrozole is largely undocumented. Therefore, we try to find out the prevalence of uh, letrozole resistant PCOS and the course of further clinical management in these women. Our study was a prospective observational study carried out in Genome Fertility Center, Kolkata, over the period of five years, which was approved by the Institutional Ethic Committee. Now, we included the women having PCOS defined by mod uh, modified rotterdam criteria, who are trying for pregnancy for more than one year, age 21 to 35, who have treatment name and who did not have any other associated infertility factors. <coughs> we excluded the women having sexual dysfunction, other endocrinopathy, like other causes of hyperandrogenism, hyperprotectinemia, anemia, overt hypothyroidism, endometriosis, diabetes, cancer, all of them were excluded. Thorough evaluation was done as per recommendation, which included history, physical examination, fertility workup of both the partners, hormonal assessment in details, and transvaginal ultrasound scan. After taking written informed consent and doing a baseline ultrasound, we administered letrozole orally in the dose of 5 mg for 5 days, followed by scan to confirm the growth of dominant follicle. And dominant follicle was defined as follicle measuring more than 10 mg. If follicle was developing, this was followed up until ovulation happened, or if there was no ovulation, even after follicular size reaching more than 20 mm, it was triggered with HCG international unit of 5000 international unit. If still there was no dominant follicle developing, in the next cycle, retrosome dose was increased to 7.5 mg per day for 5 days. If still failed, then the final cycle, the dose was increased to 10 mg per day. And if the woman did not ovulate with 10 mg, she was termed as letrozole resistant. In the next cycle, we tried clomiphene, 100 mg initially for 5 days. If still it did not work, then we increased the dose to 150 mg. If still it failed, this was termed as clomiphene resistant. Now, we had these women who were resistant to both clomiphene and letrozole. Then we openly discussed the two options. Either you can go for laparoscopic ovarian drilling or you can go for gonadotropin. Those who opted for laparoscopic ovarian drilling, after three months of surgery, we followed them in unstimulated cycle and we tried to find out whether there was spontaneous ovulation. If in three consecutive cycles there was no spontaneous ovulation, they were termed as resistant. And then gonadotropin was advised. In case of gonadotropin, we used low dose step up protocol using recombinant FSH hormone, 75 mg per day for 6 to 7 days, followed by scan. If follicle was growing, then the same dose was continued. If there was no uh, growth of dominant follicle, the dose was increased by 37.5 mg per day, followed by scan every another 6 to 7 days. This was the scheme of gonadotropin we used, and we tried not to exit total 225 mg per day of gonadotropin. If the woman responded to a particular drug, the same was continued for next three cycles. If still there was no luck, they were offered three cycles of IUI followed by IVF, and if they conceived, we followed them until the pregnancy was ended. We followed strict cycle cancellation policy, that is, if more than two follicles measuring more than 14 mm develop, we cancel the cycle or given them the option to convert it into IVF. 
Then we analyze the data using appropriate statistical methods. So over the study period of five years, we got 1851 women with PCOS with infertility, of whom 1522 were included in our study. Out of them, 50 could not ovulate even when we use the letrozole dose of 10 mg per day. That is, we can calculate that the prevalence of letrozole resistant PCOS in our study was 2.7%. Out of these 50 women, 19 responded to clomiphene by developing 1 to 2 follicles. Among these 19 women, 7 conceived with clomiphene alone and most of them conceived within first 3 cycles. When we compared between clomiphene resistant and clomiphene uh, sensitive women, we found that there was no difference in terms of clinical parameters like age, BMI, etc. Regarding the hormonal parameters, only hormone, luteinizing hormone level was raised significantly in women who were clomiphene resistant. Now, those women who were clomiphene resistant, out of them, only one opted for laparoscopic ovarian drilling. Unfortunately, she did not ovulate spontaneously, so she also eventually required gonadotropin. So, total 24 women required gonadotropin in our study. Out of them, majority developed one to two follicles only, but in one case, 10 follicles were developed, so after discussion, this woman agreed to convert the cycle into IVF. So, total dose and uh, duration of gonadotropin required in, uh, in, in our study is shown here. Maximum dose required were, uh, was uh, 187.5 international units per day, and maximum days of stimulation was 24 days. Among these women who received gonadotropin, 9 conceived and all of them conceived within the first two cycles. If we consider all the 50 women who were electrosole resistant, we found that 16 conceived, 17 lost to follow up during conceive, and 16 didn't conceive and they opted for IUI. And the single woman uh, who had to convert the cycle into IVF, unfortunately, she also didn't conceive. The mean time to pregnancy from start of treatment was 10.8 months we found there was no difference between clomiphene and gonadotropin in terms of pregnancy rate and more importantly the time to pregnancy was not significantly different which means that if you try clomiphene before trying gonadotropin you are not actually delaying the time to conception similarly the endometrial thickness was similar between women who responded to clomiphene and those who responded to gonadotropin now total 11 live births happened uh, that is the live birth rate was 69% and it was pretty uh, com uh, similar between clomiphene and gonadotropin. We encountered total 3 multiple pregnancy, 2 with clomiphene, both of them were twin, 1 monochorionic monoamniotic which was spontaneously reduced to single tone having ended in live birth, another deciduous twin ended in live birth of twin babies. In gonadotropin group, one woman had dichorionic triamniotic pregnancy which unfortunately miscarried by 14 weeks. Preterm birth occurred in around one third of the cases. The obstetric complications were not very uncommon but it's important to note we did not encounter any single case of congenital anomaly out of these babies. So this is the summary of findings of our study. Now conventionally Letrozole was used as 2.5 mg as starting dose. The data mainly came from postmenopausal breast cancer women. But remember, PCOS women are different because they are young women and they are having high level of estradiol in blood. Therefore, probably 2.5 mg will not suffice. As a result, there are some studies which use the starting dose of 7.5 mg, and we also found some studies which recommended that the starting dose should be as high as 10 to 12.5 mg. In the literature, studies were not consistent regarding the studies uh, regarding the starting dose of letrozole. Therefore, because most of the studies showed that 5 mg can be the starting dose, so we started with 5 mg. <coughs> now regarding the ovulation rate with letrozole, different study found different ovulation rate and there was no similarities because the population were different and dose included were also di different. But we found 97% of our population responded to letrozole because we used high dose. We went up to 10 milligram of dose. 
which means that 2.7% were resistant to lead poisoning. In the literature, we found only one study which mentioned the term quote unquote letrozole resistant, although the prevalence was higher because they did not exit the dose of 5 mg. It is well known letrozole is well established drug which can be used in clomiphene resistant. But can we think other way around? Yes? Can you think of using clomiphene in case of letrozole resistant? We did not find any supporting evidence in the literature. And I feel many people are still scared to use clomiphene in electrosol resistance because they are scared about thinning of endometrium with clomiphene. But this endometrial thickness, thinning of endometrial thickness, this fear is unfounded. And we also did not encounter much thinning of endometrium and we got reasonably good pregnancy and live birth rate. Only two cases were multiple pregnancy. And more importantly, use of clomiphene before gonadotropin did not delay the time to conception. Gonadotropin, we recommend as hard line of agent in contrast to what has been advised in many guidelines. We advise try electrozole if that fails, try clomiphene, then gonadotropin. There are three guidelines and review articles which followed this uh, recommendation. However, they did not show any supporting evidence in their favor. But when you are using gonadotropin, you are basically skating on ice. Therefore, you have to be very cautious, start with low dose. As there is no difference between urinary and recombinant gonadotropin, but we used a recombinant one because these are easier to handle and they are purer. And with this low dose step up regime, we in, uh, encountered only one case of multifollicular development and only one case of multiple pregnancy. Therefore, in an action, in electrosol induced cycle, we must, must, must do follicular study to confirm whether the lady is ovulating or not. If electrosol fails, we should try clomiphene before trying gonadotropin. And when we have to resort to gonadotropin, we should try low dose step up protocol. We acknowledge several limitations of our study small sample size, only 50, single center experience, it was not randomized. We can't comment anything on laparoscopic ovarian drilling because only one woman opted for it and there was nearly 34% of women, that is one third of women who were lost to follow up. Having said that, we recommend to correctly identify the women having PCOS who are electrosol resistant because it will reduce the time to pregnancy. But our studies, the findings of our study need to be confirmed by large scale randomized control trial with adequate power and in different population. We acknowledge the contribution of these people in our study, including all the participants who agreed kindly to participate in our study. And thank you, Ashre, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And this is my mail ID. If you want to know any details of our study, please don't hesitate to drop me a mail. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this was a lot of work eh? uh, to describe so thoroughly this uh, total uh, number of patients. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And also on a very speedy performance here. Um, there's one, uh, let me start off with a question from um, an online uh, Congress uh, member. And it was actually the same uh, question that I had myself. And that's about uh, metformin. Is, do you think there's a place to add metformin in a woman who is literal resistant, like we sometimes do in clomiphene? Yes, I was thinking that this is the, probably the first question I am going to encounter. Uh, we did not use metformin. Uh, the data suggests that this metformin can be used uh, in case of clomiphene resistant cases or in case when we use gonadotropin because it can increase the sensitivity of uh, clomiphene and gonadotropin. But we did not find any data on role of metformin in uh, uh, along with electrozone or in electrozone resistant cases. So we re refrain from using any insulin sensitizers because we tried to find out whether the sole agents like tomifin and gonadotropin whether they are effective as, as sole therapy. So that's why we did not use any insulin sensitizer. Okay, thank you. Other question from the audience? Yes, sir. Sorry, there, in the back there. Nice that presentation, sir. Thank you. Well, sir, before shifting to clomiphene, 
Have you tried beer like lifestyle? Yeah, lifestyle changes was the first line of management we advised even before starting letrozole, not before to, uh, to meeting. All the women uh, uh, were advised lifestyle changes immediately after the diagnosis. Okay. Uh, what lifestyle changes you suggest, sir? Uh, we uh, followed uh, those, uh, the you know, the ASHRAE guidelines suggested that smart protocol uh, for uh, weight management, diet and exercise, and we have uh, expert uh, therapies for the diet management. We refer to them and we follow this smart protocol. So I have tried in these cases diet rich in myoestrol, carodianestrol, and with metformin, and very few cases with my finding data that was resistant. Yeah, that may be very interesting find. Thank you. Yes, can you please state your name and where you're from? Uh, so I'm from Armenia, a uh, uh, resident clinician, a uh, fertility specialist. So I would like to ask, uh, in the treatment of letrozole resistant PCOS patient, how do you decide between proceeding with laparoscopic or drilling or gonadotropy in injections? Are there any criteria or patient characteristics like no, our study uh, was not randomized one, so we openly discussed that there are two options you can go for. It's the patients who decided. We discussed pros and cons of gonadotropin versus laparoscopic ovarian drilling. We said these are the advantages and these are the disadvantages. But as you uh, have seen here, only one woman wanted a laparoscopic ovarian drilling, but yeah. all the women said that no, we'll rather go for gonadotropin. Because I think uh, injection is better, yes, than the surgery. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Shorak, last, uh, last question yes. for now. Yes, please. Yes. Is there any correlation with the body weight of the patient and doses of electrogen? Uh, we did not find it because rather we did not analyze it because we mainly concentrated on women with electrogen resistance. Although we had this data, but we did not analyze it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, what time uh, we need to end this interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.